I'm Dr. Ben Jackson. I recently completed my PhD um, on 18th century men's material culture from Queen Mary University of London. Um, it examined a range of objects and one that can tell us about the changing or um, kind of continual um, material expressions of masculine identity, the long 18th century running really to its very limits between 1650 and 1850. Um, this research is, is kind of tangential to some of the work that I was doing. Uh, on my PhD, I examined uh, guns and weaponry and in relation to sporting, and that's kind of going to contextualize uh, some of the work that uh, I'm going to present to you today. Um, I will start um, by saying that what I'm actually going to talk about today, hunting, sporting equipment, shooting, is something that has often been examined in terms of topography, regional topography, landscape and the privilege of land ownership. And actually what my paper is going to do today is actually take this kind of uh, these kinds of discussions and actually centre them in domestic space and thinking about it in terms of something that we traditionally think of as happening outside of the domestic arena. Um, historians have now for most of a decade argued that elite men's material culture was an expression of their refined, cultivated and polite identity, or sometimes their lack and rejection of it. These associations are prevalent throughout the 18th century and hunting paraphernalia. Today, I'll be particularly talking about sporting guns, hunting equipment in that sort of kind of weaponry uh, terminology. It was both a sign of wealth and privilege or a lack of sophistication and impoliteness, depending, for example, upon which side of the political divide you sat. The Tory leaning figure Sir Roger de Coverley is derided in Joseph Addison and Richard Steele's wig leaning spectator uh, periodical for having a hall covered with the horns of several kinds of deer that he has killed in the chase, which he thinks is the most valuable furniture of his house. This paper is going to examine and investigate what constitutes valuable furniture to these landed men. It analyzes both household and probate inventories of landed titled households from 1626 to 1792 to reveal the changing location and display of hunting paraphernalia in country houses. It demonstrates how changing prescriptions of elite masculine behavior influences men's sporting material culture and the impact that had on the domestic interior and space of country houses. Uh, to contextualise this research in a longer version of this paper, it is actually centred around examination of the figure of the gentleman sportsman. And I particularly am interested in examining this new type, new kind of cultural character um, as a masculine consumer identity and how he was appealed to through advertising um, and through uh, objects themselves and how the changing uh, design and use of hunting equipment over the period of the long 18th century uh, reflects change in beha masculine behaviours. So historians have traced the legal, political, social and regional history of hunting uh, since the 1980s but men's attitudes to hunting has received less attention. Work on hunting and masculinity has stressed its militaristic and nationalist, nationalistic associations and its rejection of forms on and expressions of urbane, polite masculinity. A wealth of inventory studies have detailed the domestic interior and its material culture, and there is an abundance of literature on the country house, its architecture and furnishing. But one of the primary functions of the country house, sporting and hunting, and its gendered material culture and space has often been surprisingly under-investigated. This paper uses a small but suggestive exact sample of English inventories in the 17th and 18th centuries. The long period of my chosen inventories and the examination of multiple inventories of the same house over time enables a discussion of the changes in sporting material culture in the period. The paper links these material changes to changing codes and expressions of elite masculine identity and attitudes towards gendered space. A study of three household inventories from 1626, 1708 and 1741 of the Tolmash family, the Earls of Dysart at Helmium Hall in Suffolk, demonstrates the changing location of hunting and shooting objects within the home raising the issue of gendered associations and functions of rooms. 
1626 household inventory reveals a material world typical of a newly titled country family in early 17th century England. In this inventory, arms, weapons, and hunting paraphernalia dominated Helmingham's material culture, bristling in both the public space of the Great Hall and the more private masculine space of the master's chambers. One third of the objects recorded in the hall can be categorized as heraldic objects, weaponries, or hunting tools, including a hawk's perch and two stag's heads. Meanwhile, in the more private space of Sir Lionel Tolmash's newly created chamber, the infantry records a new marble fireplace, rich wall and window hangings, chess and writing tables, gilt boxes, and a collection of guns and swords. In an adjoining closet, this room contained diverse small things such as boxes, guns, crossbow cases, fishing nets, and horse tackle. However, with some of these kept in Sir Lionel's private room and not in the armory that was president, present throughout the 155 years of the sample, this suggests personal use of these items. It suggests a deep attachment to these objects that they are more than merely utilitarian tools of estate management or indeed estate defense, but were instead collected and displayed as markers of identity in both public and private spaces within the home. The storage and the display of weaponry alongside hunting equipment shows that the association between militaristic and male and militaristic and hunting male identities was played out in material form. The object scape signals an altogether masculine space populated with new and fashionable and old quintessential male objects that were utterly typical furnishings of a royal seat. The trophies of the hunt were displayed in the front facing parts of the early modern country house and the weapons of the hunt in the more private, intimate space of the chamber. A completely new material culture appears at Helmingham in the 1708 inventory, that of hot drinks equipment, delfware, glassware, and an abundance of art and decorative plasterwork and marble. Helmingham changed architecturally too, with a new suite of apartments for Lord and Lady Tolmash respectively formed from old rooms. Whilst hunting equipment and weaponry had comprised one third of the hall's contents in 1626, by 1708, the vast majority of the hall's contents were pieces of art and only 11 decorative half pikes remained. Hunting objects were relocated and displayed in newly created private spaces. Moving forward to the 1741 household inventory, hunting paraphernalia was removed to an apartment of private rooms on the first floor, where there was a collection of hunting paraphernalia belonging to the fourth Earl's son, Lord Hunting Tower. It consisted of equestrian equipment, two red pistol cases, and a map of Suffolk. So over the period of these inventories, we see them moving increasingly to more private, increasingly private spaces at Helmingham. The three Helmingham inventories suggest that changes in early modern household structure and the changing perceptions and use of domestic space influence the display and storage of hunting and shooting paraphernalia. The relocation of sporting equipment and trophies to more private spaces can be explained by changing attitudes to and uses of social space in the country house. During this period, Matt Girard writes, country houses, great halls were used less frequently for communal dining between the family and the household. And again, we see here those distinctions between the kind of what a polite hall should be, the polite taste in the spectator at the beginning of the paper and what is actually happening in practice. The 17th century introduction of uh, private family dining parlours, the back stairs, servants' halls and servants' annexes attests to landed families' growing desire for privacy and the spatial separation of family and household. As a hall's function changed, so too did its decoration. Girard notes how arms and armours were still hung in great halls, but no longer for use but as decoration. And by the 18th century, they were often displayed by classical hunting scenes in relief plasterwork. The increased desire to architecturally enforce household hierarchies meant that late 17th century country houses introduced rooms with gendered associations based on their function, and by the mid 18th century, their decoration. As the example of Glenham Palace shows on the screen, the introduction of symmetrical hierarchies of rooms for husbands and wives 
to conduct particularly gendered activities within the country house appeared as suites of enfilade of rooms in succession apartments. And you can see that kind of very crudely circled on the plan of Blenheim there, um, and that you see the very distinct separation of the Duchess of Marlborough's uh, dressing room on one end to the grand cabinet of the Duke of Marlborough right at the end of the succession of rooms on the other. Uh, I'm now going to turn to some other case studies um, and looking at a probate inventory taken on the death of Earl Litchfield of Ditchley Park in Oxfordshire in 1772. It records a hunting related objects in more private rooms again, so we're seeing now kind of a growing pattern. In a closet adjoining Lord Litchfield's library and dressing room, the inventory records a material world of polite, cultivated, elite masculinity. Amongst printing and bookbinding machinery and a plethora of musical instruments, there was a neat silver mounted hunting gun, pistols and swords. In the, skipped my order, in the 1782 probate inventory of Ossley Park in Middlesex, the home of the East India Company family, the Childs, in a circular closet on the principal floor, the infantry recorded a fashionable Wilton carpet, a mahogany shaving stand, drawings of Osterley, and a silver mounted fowling piece or hunting gun, um, an Indian sabre, some fishing rods, and a Dolan's telescope. The 1782 probate inventory of Wentworth Woodhouse records 35 sporting guns and pistols from British and European manufacturers in a gun closet adjoining Lord Rockingham's antechamber, so again, a more private room, on the new expansive Palladian East Front pictured on the screen. The inventory recorded a wealth of equestrian portraiture in the red drawing room that preceded the gun closet and included many by Rockingham's famed equestrian painter protege, George Stubbs. As at Helmingham and Ditchley, hunting and equestrian pursuits were present in the country house's material culture, not as hunting trophies and stag heads, but as aestheticized and pacified representations of sporting prowess and knowledge. The introduction of the gun closet rather than an armory demonstrates for elite men like Rockingham, even when a room was dedicated to weaponry, hunting and shooting objects were not stored, but they were displayed. It is worth noting that the shift in material culture is also a result of global expansion, travel and empire. Rockingham, we know, went on the Grand Tour and the child's family's connections of hunting paraphernalia at Osterley are the result of the family's connections with the East India Company. While I don't have much time today to discuss the implications of items such as mahogany tables, Indian sabers, Chinese lacquerware and hunting guns, I would welcome the opportunity to talk about that in the Q&A. Let's move towards my final um, case study. It's taken from a 1792 probate inventory of Houghton Hall, the Palladian pile of the Earls of Orford on the death of the third bachelor Earl. It reveals a unique attitude to space and hunting objects. At Houghton, the Eastern block of rooms on the ground story was given over to the display of hunting material culture and its sociable functions. The entrance hall that you would access through the ground, store, the ground story uh, door you see on the screen uh, in the arcade hall contained four stag's heads. Hunting trophies like stag heads, often killed by past generations of huntsmen, symbolize the elite lineage of the current hunter. The arcade hall was similar in design and decoration to a baronial hall. With groin vaulted arches and unpainted stone walls, it is architecturally very similar to the stables at Houghton as well. Gerard notes that when the use of the heavier rustication, so that's the kind of um, heavier stone detailing on the basement story, um, is used on the ground floor rather than a piano noble, it indicates this falls more traditional, more rustic function. It is literally more rustic in function and in design. The hunting or sportsman's hall adjoining the arcade hall is a rare example of a room functioning specifically for the display of hunting equipment and pre and post hunt entertainment. Like the arcade hall, it too contained a stag's head, as well as large mahogany and marble tables and leather chairs and a map of Norfolk. Here, new modern luxury furnishings sat alongside old emblems of elite status. As at Helmingham, Ditchley and Osterley, scientific instruments were recorded in the same rooms as shooting equipment. The breakfast parlour contained a barometer, as well as a pair of gun racks, a dressing table and a mahogany dining table. Barometers, 
a 17th century invention, were used to predict changes in weather and were thus crucial to ascertaining the weather conditions for hunting and shooting. In this instance, the barometer was not merely on display as an object of scientific progress, but played a very practical role for the sportsman within the room itself. At Houghton in 1792, older traditional sporting material culture of hunting trophies and stag heads sat alongside objects of polite science. The movement of hunting goods to increasingly more private and more gendered spaces in these country house inventories is, I think, linked to the civilising process. Sociologists Nobra Elia and Jonah Brundage and historians Philip Carter and Robert Shoemaker have all argued that with new polite modes of masculine behaviour in the 18th century, honour and civility became less militaristic and violent in its construction. This pacification could be seen in the replacements of pikes and spears with portraiture in front facing spaces and how sporting guns, fishing rods and horse furniture were increasingly located within men's personal rooms. There are other aspects that I could identify, such as the declining military role of the genery and the rise of a standing army, but those are kind of tangential to what I think is going on here. The material presence of martial masculinity remained the same in the country house across the period of these inventories studied, but the material objects that expressed this martial masculinity changed. Stag heads were replaced with sporting portraiture. Sporting guns were no longer displayed alongside pikes and spears, but telescopes, barometers, and in some instances I found globes as well. In this context, sporting material culture in the country house shifted from hunting trophies to instruments. Militaristic masculinity was now represented in an intellectual and scientific material culture that showcased an appreciation and engagement in enlightened knowledge and technological innovation. The changing display in the country house of elite men's sporting guns is indicative of these objects' polite status. As a masculine cultural ideal changed from, from chivalric honour to, to polite refinement, so too did men's material culture. Guns and the paraphernalia associated with them remained integral to the gentleman sportsman, but his masculinity was also demonstrated in objects of global luxury, polite science, and also polite entertainment. In examining these inventories, I suggest early modern manhood did not give way to polite, refined masculinity as neatly as many historians of the gender have suggested, but that martial prowess was expressed in a new material base of technology and science. Thank you. Okay, I've unmuted myself. There, cheers for that, Ben. That was, that, was, that was brilliant. We've already had some questions in the chat. So we'll take the questions um, at the end. Um, and I'll now hand over um, to Sean to, to present his paper and um, obviously do an introduction as well. Over to you, Sean. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tosh. Um, so, yeah, I'm one of the Strand co conveners and I am professor in the Department of Sociology at University of Essex. And this paper comes out of a, a, a forthcoming book um, to be published by McGill University Press in the autumn called Passions for Birds, Science, Sentiment and Sport. And there's some crossovers with what Ben's been talking about, although it's set in the 20th century in terms of there's, there's chapters on wild fowling and falconry. Um, but today I'm going to talk about uh, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring and, and geographies of environmental crisis in the late 50s, early 60s. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring first published in, oops, first published in the USA in the autumn of 1962 has become one of the founding texts of contemporary Western environmentalism. While much of the impact of the book stem from its claims about the actual and potential effects of a range of organochloride pesticides upon human health, it was Carson's account of the consequences of, the, of these toxic chemicals for bird populations that not only bequeathed the book its title, but also strikingly dramatized the pressing dangers of post-war agricultural change and the intricate, on, upon the intricate web of life. In this paper, I explore the way Rachel Carson 
and the scientists, bird recorders, and amateur observers whose studies and accounts she drew upon helped to make visible and legible the new threats to bird life from toxic chemicals. Carson's skill was to link what was often localized and fragmentary evidence of bird deaths and population declines to an understanding of a wider crisis of the natural environment. Carson used the evidence she collected from fellow Audubonites. These are the members of the state Audubon um, Bird Societies as a member of the DC Audubon Society. She used evidence from these fellow Audubonites and sympathetic scientists to map the distinctive geography of loss um, in America and Britain linked to math, mass bird deaths. This geography of loss and the tales of distressing encounters with dead and dying birds, which Carson collected, provides a key emotional register for the book. In the paper, I explore some of this emotive evidence collected by Carson and consider how she wove this into the incendiary narrative of Silent Spring. I also draw upon the tales of loss stirred by the book amongst its readers. These came from both American and British audiences and revealed feelings of melancholia, sadness, and emotional distress amongst at least a section of Carson's readership. These emotional responses echoed the book's picture of environmental crisis and the world, as Carson put it, where no birds sing. For these readers, like Carson herself, the stripping away of the animating presence of charismatic bird species in daily life had impoverished familiar landscapes, subtracting, subtracting something essential from them. From the publication of, of the first extracts of the book in June 1962, Silent Spring was, as Linda Lear notes, an immediate sensation. The book spent much of the autumn of 1962 at the top of the New York Times bestseller list, with sales passing 106,000 copies in the week before Christmas 1962. By March 1963, it has sold more than half a million copies, being selected as the Book of the Month Club and being published in the UK and West Germany. French, Swedish, Dutch, Danish, Finnish and Italian translations appeared through 1963. Much of the impact of the book stemmed from the fact that it found a readership already sensitized to the dangers of unseen environmental threats an emerging skepticism about scientific progress and fears that powerful vested interests in American society sought to hide inconvenient truths from the American people. Silent Spring cleverly played on these fears. It mixed scientific fact with the language of mythology and the disturbing tropes of European fairy tales. These hinted at the unforetold consequences of human action, of doom and disaster unwittingly created, and of human arrogance leading to hubris. These themes were powerfully established in the prologue to the book. Titled A Fable for Tomorrow, Carson conjured the story of a fictitious American town struck down by a strange blight. As if, as she put it, an evil spell had fallen upon the town. Cattle and sheep became ill and died. Children got sick and birds disappeared. Where once there had been all life living in harmony, now, quote, everywhere there was a shadow of death. Drawing on the evidence she had collected from Audubonites and newspaper and magazine reports, Carson's fable focused on the vanishing birds. Quote, there was a strange stillness. The birds, where had they gone? Many, many people spoke of them, puzzled and disturbed. The feeding stations in the backyards were deserted. The few birds seen anywhere were moribund. They trembled violently and could not fly. It was a spring without voices. 
only silence lay over the fields and woods and marsh. This was a blight caused, Carson suggested, not by witchcraft or by enemy action, but by the people themselves. New agricultural chemicals were, as she put it, elixirs of death that brought not life, but destruction to rivers and fields, suburban backyards and the home itself. Carson turned the militarized language of the pest control programs and their war on nature against the government agencies to assert that they were laying down, quote, a barrage of poisons upon the environment and bringing, quote, a rain of death upon the surface of the earth. So it's very emotive language that Carson is, is using to paint this picture of, cri of crisis. In what was perhaps the most powerful aspect of Carson's arguments, she drew upon um, ecological understandings of the interdependence of life to point to the risks to human health from indirect exposure to these biocides. Noting that the new chemicals had already become stored in the bodies of most Americans, Carson forced her readers to not only face the unknown risks to human well-being, but to see human life as part of and dependent upon the wider natural world. Human beings were part of a food chain and bound to and dependent upon the wider natural environment. Carson also made a political argument throughout Silent Spring that government and commercial interests should be subject to greater democratic accountability and that citizens had the right to experience the joy of nature and wild birds as part of a full human flourishing. As she asked, quote, who has the right to decide for the countless legions of people who were not consulted that the supreme value is a world without insects, even though it be also a sterile world ungraced by the curving wing of a bird in flight. The story that Rachel Carson told in Silent Spring was largely an American story rooted in the landscapes created by post-war American affluence, suburbanization and technological change. Carson's opening fable had summoned up an archetypal, archetypal post-war American suburb, close to existing farmland and with its backyards supplied with bird feeders. The selection of these landscapes and places reflected the distribution of the spraying patterns of the American government and the geography of pest populations in the USA. It also drew from the places that scientists like uh, George Wallace and Joe Hickey and committed amateurs, including hundreds of Audubonites, have made their observations. In the late 1950s, the Audubon Society's magazine Field Notes had begun to capture the scale of bird population declines in the southeastern south states evidence assiduously collected by Carson. In Baton Rouge, for example, an Audubonite reported that the contents of her backyard bird feeders had been untouched for weeks. Another revealed that the, the view from his picture window once splashed with the red of 40 to 50 cardinals and crowded with other species now held only one or two birds. Reports came in from other parts of the country. The Trailside Museum of Natural History in Illinois revealed that it received many inquiries from residents in the surrounding suburbs who had found sick and dying birds following the spraying of trees for Dutch elm disease. Virginia Moe of the museum noted the typical condition of the birds. Quote, symptoms are paralysis and constant trembling and palpitation. When gently held with the legs dangling, the toes of the feet move constantly as if the birds were typewriting. Death follows in an hour or so. Local newspapers also registered the phenomenon. In July 1958, for example, a letter to the Vermont Caledonian record wondered, quote, are we killing off the birds? The correspondent claimed that since the introduction in the area of DDT to combat Dutch elm disease, quote, we have hundreds of poisoned birds delivered, delivered to us by local housewives. The toll is indeed alarming. In February 1963, the Miami Herald also reported scores of robins dying at Bay Point. 
a resident revealed how, quote, birds have been falling out of our oak tree and we've been picking them up for the past two days. Another resident revealed that following the spraying of her lawn, quote, birds began falling from the trees. By drawing upon the evidence from local newspapers and regional order of the members like these I've just discussed, I think Carson wove a compelling empirical picture of the dramatic changes in bird populations in the USA. It gave a strong emotional punch to her book, elaborating upon the shocking picture of American landscapes devoid of familiar birds that she had established in her introductory fable for tomorrow. Silent Spring was also important in the way, for the way in which it welded together the shared sense of loss amongst those who read the book. Readers were, readers were stirred to write to Carson, seeing a connection between their own personal local experiences of bird declines and Carson's narrative of environmental change. These letters confirmed the mapping of the crisis of both wild and suburban America and the parallel if different geography of environmental crisis in the UK. Amongst the letters that Carson received was one from, from Florida resident Philip E. Howard Jr. He wrote to Carson to tell her of the disappearance of local birds. Quote, my wife and I have noted the scarcity of bluebirds and I have seen fewer eagles in the last two or three years than formerly and none at all this winter. At dinner the other evening, a lady from Orlando told me of seeing a bird collapse on her lawn as, she tried to, as he tried to feed while the sprayers were working. She took it in, but it died in a short time. Sandra L. Showalter from Chicago told Carson a similar story. I have noticed that in my city, there are almost no birds in areas which were formerly, in which they formerly flourished. From Urbana, Illinois, Marcus Goldman revealed, the effect of the spraying campaigns on the birds was disastrous. For a number of years, robins seemed to have disappeared. And in 1963, the numbers were much smaller than in the years before the spraying. In Minnesota, A.O. Haig told Carson, quote, years ago in the, here in the Red River Valley, there were many kinds of birds. Now they have almost vanished. And there are also letters from Britain where, where British readers um, brought to Carson's attention evidence of the dramatic effect on bird populations, including the effect on um, birds of prey, which became something of a core celebre in the, in the uh, early and mid 1960s. Carson, however, did not need reminding of the British evidence. Silent Spring drew upon the research into the effects of toxic chemicals in the UK. These sections of her book brought a picture of the British countryside into the largely American geography of loss that she documented. If the avian dramatis persona in landscape geography works to differentiate the British and American experiences of the crisis in wild bird, bird populations, citizens and bird watchers on both sides of the Atlantic were forced to confront similar distressing encounters with dead and dying birds and to wonder where some of their familiar species have gone. The emotional dynamics of the toxins crisis generated a shared experience and a common bond in both wild America and its suburban backyards and in the British countryside. The environmental crisis worked to reconfigure human avian relations. Whilst wild birds continue to evoke great pleasure, joy, and a sense of wonder, this was now mingled with sadness, melancholia, and feelings of loss. For many people, looking at birds became cut across by the shadow of death, by population decline, distressing encounters with dead and dying birds, and landscapes transformed by the loss of birds. This cumulative sense of loss meant that to look was to see, if not a dying world, as the author J.A. Baker suggested in his 1967 book, The Peregrine, itself um, a book very much in dialogue with Carson. But it was to see a set of landscapes in which formerly abundant common birds were in steep decline. It would bequeath, I think, a new set of experiential norms for encountering and watching birds in the era of a new environmental crisis.
Okay. Sorry, we're going back to the whole. I'm on mute thing again. Sorry, Sean. Um, it's cut off midway there. Hi, can can, I, can, I, can someone let me know that I can hear me, please? Yes. You Brilliant. Can sorry, sorry about that. Um, so my my, com my connection dropped out a little there. Uh, and what we'll do again, um, just to revert to to previous formula, we'll take questions um towards the end. Um. Now I'm going to hand over to uh, to Murray Seacombe at my um, my former university, Lancaster. Um, Murray's going to be talking about managing people, managing space, constables, highways, and connectivity in the 17th century Halifax. So we're moving um, we're moving back a couple of centuries. Uh, and just let me make sure you can share your screen, Murray. Just give me one just give me one moment. There we go. Just want to make that full screen. That should yeah. work. Okay, Murray. So you should see a picture of a path. I can't see that. But have you got my title slide? Though? I can see your title slide, but you need to just click on the the bottom where it goes on to um, full screen. So if you just scroll down, it should allow you to do that. I think I'm, I'm on the wrong screen at the moment. I'm going to stop sharing and go in again. OK. Um, Is, is that any better? Is it without the notes? That's that's full screen now. Yeah, I don't that's know if any if anyone else can confirm. That's what I can see. Okay, I'll get going. So, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about the way highways were maintained and managed in in the 17th century in the parish of Halifax, and I should perhaps make a preliminary point about the road in the photo. So around about 1650, this was actually the main road between Rochdale and Keithley. Um, so my study area is in the South Pennines where travel and transport was almost entirely um, by horseback or on foot um, until the mid 18th century. And I want to sort of start by thinking about um, the, uh, to, to conceptualize the issues. It's very clear that territory and boundaries were critical for early modern office holders. And it's hardly surprising that a spatial dimension is embedded in these two uh, classic formulations of the early modern state by Messrs. Braddock and Hinville. I find Hinville's idea of initiatives negotiated across space particularly productive. My findings highlight how particularities of space and place were central to administration in the localities, and thus administration was indeed multilateral. Nevertheless, infrastructure management remains at the margins of discussions about early modern governance and state formation, in contrast to the major themes of social welfare, religion, and the fiscal military state. If you like, the historiography resembles one of John Speed's county maps, towns, villages and country parks, but no roads joining them up. One possible reason for this is that despite Brodie Waddell's survey of manorial regulation, the scale, ambition and longevity of manorial road management has not been fully appreciated. My analysis of the paper records from the Halifax and Brighouse Courts Leet in the Manor of Wakefield uses 6,000 highway related orders and immersements from 21 townships between 1605 and 1700. And these were not just about nuisances and disputes between neighbours. Major routes that linked the manor and parish with Lancashire were repeatedly targeted for repairs. Also, Contrary to the received account, township constables, not highway surveyors, were in charge of roads in many townships for most of my period. I've therefore developed a second line of inquiry using exceptionally detailed constable accounts to develop a microhistory for one township, Sorby. Sorby's constables were recording spending on road maintenance funded from taxation as early as 1629, much earlier than the accepted 
time scale. And this chart um, manages to combine, probably uh, breaking all the rules, uh, manorial court cases and constable spending on roads in Sorby. The columns are the number of presentments of its own roads per session at the Halifax Court Fleet. And these fluctuated around about one per session, so two per year, um, just at the point um, until 1670, um, which is just at the point when spending took off. The red line is the constable spending on roads which reached 14 pounds in 1692 to three before stopping altogether when the township appointed its first highway surveyor as far as I can discover. I should say that the gap in the red line stems from there being no surviving accounts between 1663 and 1670. So a central challenge for me has been to interpret this surge in spending on roads in Sorby from the 1670s. While much of the work has been in terms of social polarization and the emergence of a leadership group in the township, um, a vestry, although perhaps they wouldn't have liked the name, um, and fluctuations in trade, in today's talk, I want to focus on why road maintenance should have been so important to the constables of Sorby. So this is a map of the parish uh, the large West Riding Parish for Halifax was uh, had 23 townships. There was a mixed economy of pastoral agriculture, mostly textile manufacture, particularly wool and cloth, mineral extraction, that's coal and stone, um, and a service economy based on the town of Halifax. Sorby in yellow was large. It would actually take you then as now, probably two to three hours to ride across it, um, and it had a scattered population of just over 2,000. Halifax is to the east, Rochdale and Manchester to the west. And its territorial boundaries had two major complications. Firstly, part of it was called Soyland um, to the south, which had a chapel at Rippenden um, that was affiliated to the parochial chapel at Elland, which meant its church wardens and overseers of the poor had different lines of accountability from the rest of Sorby, whose local chapel of ease looked to the mother church at Halifax. Nevertheless, these two parts of the, of the township shared a single constable. And unsurprisingly, there were periodic disputes, especially about the level of constable rates. Secondly, on this map, and here you have to look very closely, you can just about see um, a strip of purple around the north of a township called Erringdon, immediately to the north of Sorby. And that, uh, Erringdon was actually a, a, hunt, a medieval hunting park until about 1451, and this strip became known rather quaintly as the Sorby Rumble, um, and it meant that Sorby had boundaries with eight other parish townships, as well as Lancashire's Rochdale to the west. The only significant settlements were Sorby Town, perhaps two or three hundred people, not, not much more, Rippenden and Mytham Road, rather smaller. The fulling mills along the Calder and its tributaries supported a vigorous woolen cloth industry. And just to give you some idea of the success of that cloth industry, um, this is a, uh, the house of John Dearden, who was a second or third generation clothier in Sorby. Um, he was actually the constable in 1650 and played a part in the vestry and the audit committee for the township thereafter. Uh, and you can see the, the size and scale of his house. And it is his, just about to see his initials down here. It actually says 1649, no, that's right. Um, JD or ID. So, the, so, well, I just adjust my, my, my notes. The duties and stasis of an early modern constable um, have been explored by Joan Kent, a classic study. The activities itemized for expenses in the accounts concur with her findings, but they also demonstrate how the office was particularly concerned with space. 
the law and order function meant regular trips both within the township and across other parts of the parish, and even further afield to the various courts. Constables were also responsible for removing vagrants and people without settlement status and checking the passes of authorised military and civilian travellers. Assessments for national and local taxation gave constables a thorough knowledge of land holdings within the township, while for much of the period the constable was also tasked with supporting militia soldiers and army detachments. So let's take a closer look. This is a map of locations mentioned in the accounts in a single peacetime year that are relevant to law and order. The bigger the circles, the more frequent the visits. If I'd done a map for the accounts for 1644, clearly it would have been a very different uh, pattern, but it would have been spatially quite complex as well. Top of the list, unsurprisingly, were duties within the township. Uh, so those, that's the big circle at Sorby and at Rippenden closely matched by Halifax Town, the venue for two court leak sittings and regular petty sessions in the 1630s. Visits to justices out of sessions were spread between a chap called John Farrer at Ewood to the north and Thomas Thornhill at Fixby, uh, both within the parish. But they also, the, the, the guy also had to go um, as far as Otley, Kipax and Pontefract to see other justices about particular issues. If my memory serves me, serves me right, one of them was the subject of cottages and cottagers. Three visits were made to, to Wakefield, twice to take people to the House of Correction and once for a militia muster. Excluded from these are 10 occasions on which a payment was made to the High Constable at an unknown location. He may have had an agent nearer to Sorby. However, the, the petty constable, the local constable, carefully recorded the locations of 14 bridges repaired from county funds right across the West Riding, ending actually in a payment for Mytham Royd Bridge, which is in uh, Soviet itself. There are also two payments for plague affected Hull. Altogether, 20 pounds was passed to county funds out of a total rating income of 35. And of the remaining 15 pounds, three pounds was actually spent on road repairs in the township. So you can see the, the, the spatial element involved. Both the Leet and the quarter sessions were used to protect the township's interest as happened elsewhere indeed. And this was very often in terms of control of space and infrastructure some examples on the slide. So these actions at the Leet were often framed to secure repairs on roads in other townships, mostly for commercial reasons, but as you see here, also to protect a traditional funeral route to the mother church at Halifax. Cases at quarter sessions were more likely to concern limiting financial liability, an obvious priority for the wealthy taxpayers who came to dominate the vestry. particular joy of these accounts is, uh, is are the, uh, the details that you get about tra people traveling through. Um, and what I did was to collect the points of origin and lost destination for the various categories of people escorted by the constables over a period of time. It's, it doesn't happen every year, uh, but it does happen in many years. If Yorkshire is predictably at the top of the list, less expected are the high numbers for Ireland and Scotland. Sorby was situated on a strategic use, a route which we heard about earlier on today, used by both Daniel Defoe and Celia Fiennes, crossing the Pennines at Blackstone Edge. People going to or coming from Ireland via Chester or Liverpool gave Sorby a window on the wider world, which extended to North America in one direction and via Hull to the near continent in the east. Which brings us back to Sorby's, Sorby Constable's uh, responsibility for roads. So this map shows, this map shows the location of orders submitted by Sorby to the court leet before the civil wars. 
um, which were, were often, uh, sometimes called panes. The thicker the lines, the higher the frequency of orders. Remarkably in this period, there is a concentration on roads outside the township itself. And these are shown in red. The cluster of orders on the road eastwards towards Halifax might be expected. That was the market town. Rather less so is the concern, rather less surprised, uh, rather less expected is the concern for two routes into Lancashire, westwards to Burnley and northwestwards to Colne. These were key routes for supplies of agricultural lime um, and probably even more so for the East Lancashire woolen cloth uh, manufacturing economy linked into Halifax at this in the, at this period. Compare this with a very different map later on the spending of the Sylvie constables on roads. The frequency of repairs again is, is indicated by thicker lines. Blue inside Sylvie, uh, the, the Solby and purple in this slightly detached um, subdivision or hamlet of Soylent. What shows up on this map is a concern to finance repairs within both parts of the, of the township to link in with the Halifax Rochdale Road, probably a sign of the growth in markets for textiles in Manchester and on the Atlantic seaboard. And this is, of course, um, as it says, uh, significantly later. This is 30, 40 years later than the first map. Apart from this highway, the focus is on improving local routes within Sorby that connected into centres of supply and trade. So these are in particular the network of routes in blue, most of which are still there today. Paradoxically, perhaps, greater intervention by country justices, which is one of the things I've tracked in my research, had the effect of shrinking the spatial parameters of township offices, at least until the Blackstone Edge route was turnpiked in 1735. It all show, shows, or at least suggests, by this time, Soyland was actually managing its own maintenance separately. So the conclusions that um, I've come to I'm arguing that our understanding of the constable role needs to be refined, not necessarily redefined, but refined in terms of responsibilities for space and travel. Highway issues were managed through the manorial and magisterial court systems, for both of which the constable was the key officer reporting issues and ensuring that orders were implemented. During the 17th century, the constable's administrative space was actually elastic. It was stretched or shrunk by phases of economic activity, especially textile manufacture, but also in response to changing administrative routines of reporting and tax collection. In default of surveyors, who were absent from much, not quite all, but much of the parish before 1692, constables were able to integrate township control of people on the move with action to repair roads for foot and equestrian traffic. Local infrastructural management thus became embedded in township level governance through the constable's dual role at the two courts. And in my view, their achievements constitute an undervalued aspect of bottom up state formation in early modern England. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Murray. Cheers. And just on, on behalf of the Social History Society, thanks for coming along. Do look at membership if you haven't already renewed or um, joined, in fact. Um, and also, the, 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 the talk will be available later on, I believe, as well. Um, we've recorded it. Um, and obviously, any questions, do follow it up with the speakers. I'm sure you'll be able to get their contact details as well. But thanks for that. And obviously, see you all um, at the rest of the conference. Thank you.